Imagine, if you will, all the adults in the US are in these 10 figures. According to the most recent census, it's about roughly equal in terms of gender balance. Now, what if I tell you that only two of them can understand this? I'm not talking about the verbal literacy necessary to read a newspaper. I'm talking about the scientific and environmental literacy necessary to read the science section of the New York Times or watch a NOVA program on TV. And sorry, ladies, this is actually wishful thinking for us. Men are actually more inclined to be scientifically literate than we are. And as a female scientist, I think this needs to change. Given the complex environmental issues facing us today, like global climate change, fracking, and GMOs, genetically modified organisms, if you're not familiar with the acronym, it's no wonder that many people feel powerless to affect change. Often people feel intimidated by science, putting up a wall to understanding. But how are we, as a society, supposed to make the best decisions if only 20% of us can actually understand what's going on. And this is an improvement from 1957, when only one out of 10 had sufficient scientific literacy. Now, I'm not suggesting that everyone run out and become a scientist tomorrow, but I am saying that we need to have a basic scientific understanding so that we can understand key terms, like knowing that there's actually a difference between climate change and global warming, because there is. Climate change is an all-encompassing term. Global warming is just an aspect of it. So winters don't actually negate global warming. Ocean acidification, changes in precipitation patterns, and changes in frequency and intensity of storms, like Hurricane Sandy that affected us all so deeply, and the recent typhoon in the Philippines. This isn't just something that we need to worry about for the future. This increases our resiliency as a society. Thus, to be civically minded, I would argue we must first be scientifically literate. Miller describes a scientifically literate citizen as someone who has a basic vocabulary of scientific terms and constructs and understands a general, the nature of scientific inquiry. Now, many of us think that we understand scientific inquiry because we know the scientific method from school. But if you ask people what's a hypothesis, a lot of them say what you think will happen and what you're trying to prove. And in fact, this from Scholastic has the hypothesis as predicting the outcome to the problem. And I'm sorry, but that's just not how science works. Well, not good science, that is. Science is all about inquiry and discovery, not going into an experiment with a preconceived notion of how it's going to turn out. For me, experiential learning is my favorite way to learn. I love the hands-on, fingers dirty, let's grab a sample of soil and run it through our fingers and figure out the percent of sand, silt, and clay, which is actually real. It's called the texture by feel method, and soil scientists use it. That's how well I want to know the earth we live on. And I bet I'm not the only one, am I? Let's see a show of hands of who likes to learn by doing. Oh my goodness, even better than I was hoping for. <laughs> so once I realized how effective just being outside and being able to answer questions were, much less doing scientific inquiry, it became clear that this is how we could get people to understand critical scientific information that isn't otherwise reaching the general public. Since adults spend the majority of their lives learning outside of school, we need non-classroom-based strategies to get them engaged and address the low scientific literacy in our society. People need opportunities to discern what's actually happening from the onslaught of terms in the media. Otherwise, it just looks like a jumble like this. But not only do we want people to know this information, we want it to be so recognized that it inspires a behavior change. That's when I became passionate about citizen science. And I'm here today to tell you why I think citizen science is how we can overcome low scientific literacy and empower people to become active solutions to our nation's environmental problems. So what exactly is citizen science? 
It's really as simple as people participating in scientific research. Contact with nature has been shown to decrease anxiety levels, stimulate creativity, promote civic advocacy, and increase sustainability. Citizen science programs provide access to these natural areas, especially in urban settings when it's not quite as obvious, while providing opportunities for interactive and participatory learning. Citizen science is not a new concept. It can be traced back to 1900, when the Audubon Society created the Christmas bird count. Avid bird watchers would go out during a two-week period in the wintertime, and they would submit their observations to professional scientists, who would then use this information to do things like population studies and migration studies. And then they can also document changes associated with climate change. Citizen science programs are incredibly diverse. They could be water, birds, insects, even stars. It doesn't matter what the subject is, it's just that people are participating in scientific research, and it's all part of the ever-growing citizen science movement. I first found out about citizen science when I moved to California to run a creek monitoring program. It was a really special place because our program was actually initiated by the people themselves. We had a lot of active Friends of Creek groups that this group was collecting information on apples, and this one was collecting information on grapes, and this one was collecting information on bananas. All really amazing, but nothing was comparable. So the county stepped in, and we took control of the program, and we initiated protocols that people could then use, and we had two different programs that we ran, a GPS program and a bioassess program. GPS is, uh, we would take GPS units and we would go out and we would document and map both natural and man-made features so that we could establish a database. And in our bioassessment program, we collected benthic macroinvertebrates, really just a fancy way of saying aquatic bugs. And so because these bugs live in the water for a certain time period in their life cycle, what we can do is we can look at how they integrate information over time. And they tell us not only about water quality, but also habitat quality. So they become really, really powerful tools. And they're tangible, and people can touch them and learn and see and explore. And everyone touted this program as being revolutionary, and it was really well received, you can see how much data they produced. And the county also liked it because it also satisfied their outreach efforts too, so it was a twofer. And I eventually realized that while data is great, are great really, that, <laughs> uh, thank you for knowing that data is cool. Um, while I realized that data is, are wonderful, the real story were the citizen scientists themselves. So I had the opportunity to go out with the friends of Pinole Creek Watershed one time. We were doing a bioassessment. And we got to this place, and it was really dirty. There was a lot of garbage. And this woman said, oh, I can't believe that people just stand on the bridge and throw garbage into the creek. And I said, oh, no, I'm, I'm, it's not thrown in. It's, there's probably an outfall right there. She said, what's an outfall? And I said, oh, well, you, you know on the storm drains, if you've ever seen this sign, no dumping, drains to ocean, drains to river? Well, it goes directly from your storm drain through a pipe into your local water body. And she said, really? I thought it was treated first. And I said, it's not even filtered. So a lot of, so she was absolutely appalled and collected trash the rest of the time. And so then every time I went out with that group, we brought this sled and we named it Rover so that when people had their arms too full of garbage, they would yell, Red Rover, Red Rover, send Rover right over. Or the Friends of Alhambra watershed. Uh, we were doing a GPS survey one time and we heard this whoosh of water and then it would stop. And then it would start again. And then it would stop again. And they dug through the invasive ivy in the bank and they found this small tube that was gushing water. And it turns out it was the laundry facilities from the Senior Citizen Center. And they had been dumping their washing machine loads directly into the creek for who knows how long. The, the, the center didn't even know that the connection existed. And so thanks to the efforts of the Friends of Alhambra Creek, they contacted the city and the, the tube was disconnected and their laundry was then put into the sanitary sewer to be treated before 
before being discharged. So I realized through all this that to truly reach people, they need to feel like they are part of something bigger than themselves and that they can actually affect change. Um, so after five years in California, I decided I needed to learn how to talk to, teach to different learning styles. And I moved here to Jersey City because honestly, it's the closest to the Midwest I have ever found. And I love it. And as luck would have it, my department head at NYU, who later became my advisor, mentor, and role model, had just received a grant to start a citizen science program for grades five through 12 using the Hudson River as our laboratory. And she brought me on to help her launch the program. So since 2011, approximately 450 students in grades five through 12 and adults have had the opportunity to go out to live and learn about biology and chemistry of the Hudson River. And 10 graduate students, some sitting right here, have learned how to design, facilitate, and manage this type of environmental monitoring program. And so these kids go out, having never set foot near the water before, thinking it's polluted, thinking it's dirty, and certainly not thinking about the biology and the chemistry of it all. And so we explore, and we engage in scientific inquiry, and we learn over in time, but more importantly, we inspire. We inspire students to engage with their local environment. What we're doing is not novel research by any means, but it is valid and accurate. And more importantly, if during this program we can inspire just one student to become a scientist someday, then I feel that we have done more for the body of science than new research ever could. Like the fact that even though it's called the Hudson River, it's actually an estuary. It's this magical place where the salt water of the ocean and the fresh water from the river upstream mix. And because it's such a magical place, only really, truly remarkable creatures can live there, like glass eels, which are these translucent eels that will then grow up to be American eels, but they're so tiny and fragile in their juvenile state. Or did you know that there are seahorses in the Hudson River and blue crabs? And it's just wonderful. I get excited about this kind of stuff. <laughs> So I realized that science and citizen science allows a one-on-one -on -one interaction with people. And so we begin at the personal level. In addition to citizen science, I also teach environmental literacy for adults. And I asked my students one time to keep track of all the garbage that they threw out for just two days, just to see, normal days, and whether they put it in the garbage, recycle, compost, or if it was something like batteries and light bulbs that needs to be handled separately. And one of my students went into the assignment saying, oh, I don't recycle. And afterwards, I said, OK, does anybody have any observations that they made? And she looked at me, and she went, plastic. I said, what? She said, everything in my garbage was plastic. I couldn't believe it. That's it. I'm recycling. And just like that, her behavior had changed. And so those are types of interactions that are facilitated at the one-to-one -one level. And once we inspire people and we get them motivated and they become community leaders, then we can step it out to the community level where we start realizing that diesel trucks are actually belching out asthma-producing particles in our children so that even breathing becomes deadly for them. And so what we think of often as social justice issues are actually environmental justice issues and environmental health issues. And so once we inspire our community to get involved and find out more information and inquire about their environment and their communities, we can step it out and our societies become more sustainable. My favorite part of being both a scientist and an educator is speaking to people. I feel that by broadcasting this message that people can be powerful agents of change, both through their personal behavior and collective action, we will be able to influence decision makers and truly change the trajectory of our societies for the better.
The more this message can be heard, the more I think people will be willing to take the necessary steps to make our cities more sustainable. And that's exactly why I think we need citizen science. So, how do you get involved? Because really, that is the key here. First, I would say, what do you like to do? What are you curious about? If you love birds, go get involved with the Audubon Society. If you love water and you're a teacher, I would love to take you out onto the Hudson and live and learn and explore with your students. If you're interested in urban issues and green infrastructure, Sustainable Jersey City is a wonderful organization, a local organization working to do just that. And if you're interested in food and concerned about your health of you and your family, get involved, find a community garden, support a CSA, Community Supported Agriculture, or meet your farmers at the local farmer's market at the PATH station. I'll leave you with one last short story about when I first realized the power of the individual. I was a Peace Corps volunteer, an environmental education, strangely enough, Peace Corps volunteer in the Dominican Republic, and I was invited to this very public reforestation event. And we had local dignitaries, and my, weren't they pleased to take a picture with a Peace Corps volunteer as well. And what we did all day was we planted trees that came in these little plastic bags. You can see all the saplings there. And everybody dutifully dug our holes and took it out of the plastic bag and planted to the tree in the ground and threw the plastic bag on the ground. And I was appalled. And I thought, oh no, what have we done? We've come here to do such a good thing, and yet we have littered this landscape. And so I was walking around, and I was picking up all the plastic bags, and this teenage boy comes up to me, and he says, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm picking up the plastic bags. And he said, why? They'll be gone in a day or two. Because for him, gone was blown away. And I said, oh, but this is plastic. It actually takes thousands of years to decompose. And so we had a conversation about that. And then he looked at me and he said, yeah, but you're just one person. You can't make a difference. And I walked away and I thought about that. And I thought, well, I don't know. I feel like I've always lived my life feeling that one person can make a difference. And then I looked up on the hillside and there were six people including that same teenage boy. And I looked at him and I said, I thought you said one person can't make a difference. And he said, but you're not one anymore. Now we're six. So never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, as Margaret Mead said, it's the only thing that ever has. Thank you.